And in honor of that, Connie has got cookies and coffee for everyone that's free of charge in the, in the hallway. <laughs> All right, at this time, I would like to call the order the October 17th, 2018 Board of Directors meeting for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I'll ask you at this time, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So before we start something that is very unusual, which will take some time and get a lot of responses, let me welcome some new people to the night. Jefferson County, Tina Francone, alternate. Littleton, Kyle Slechter, alternate. Inglewood, Cheryl Wink, alternate. Superior, Clint Folsom, alternate. And from Boulder, Sam Weaver. Congratulations and welcome to the meeting. At this time, I'll ask Ms. Garcia if she will please to take the roll. Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Lise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Nicholas Williams? Here. Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Laura Thomas? Ron Engels? Libby Zabo? Tina Francone? Here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Sam Weaver? Here. Margot Ramsden? Here. Baca? Roger Hudson? Here. George Teal? Here. Emmy Maurer? Here. Catherine Hyder? Laura Christman? Here. Richard Champion? Here. Peter? Here. Debbie Nasta? Catherine Whitman? Steve Conklin? Here. Olson? Cheryl Wink? Here. Bill Gipp? Present. Daniel Dick? Present. Drew Peterson? Bobby Sindelar? Lisa Jones? Laura Brown? Lynette Kelsey? Here. Scott Norquist? Here. Here. John Rakowski, George Lang, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Dana Goodwine, Here. Jerry Bean, Here. Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Here. Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strock, Here. Joan Peck, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Grace Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, here. John Dyack, here. Ellie Daigle, here. Mark Lasis, Clint Folsom, here. Jessica Sand, Atchison, here. Ed Starker, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, present. Bill Van Meter, here. Thank you, Connie. Next item on our agenda is to move for the approval of the agenda for tonight. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. I have a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll move on with the agenda. First item on the agenda is a report of the RTC. Uh, you will be seeing most of these presentations, so I won't go through them twice uh, for you tonight, but I will announce that Michael Silverstein, the new executive director for the Regional Air Quality Control uh, Board, was appointed to the RTC uh, yesterday as the new executive director. He's been on duty almost three weeks now. <laughs> So we've tried to get him on every board and commission in the metro area we can get him on. So he's, we got him on another one. This time I will return to the chair of the P&E committee, Mr. Dyack. Thank you, chair. Um, we, we did not meet, so I have nothing to report. All right, finance and budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Finance and Budget Committee has finished our review of the 2019 budget, so we have forwarded that to the board with a recommendation for approval. Um, you should look forward to reading that. It's a good budget, and if you have questions, you should um, forward them on to Doug and the other staff. We also authorized uh, the Executive Director to receive some additional grant funding that the AAA will be able to use um, and put to good effect in our region. Thank you. Well, other than the opportunity of every once in a while we see through public input by changing council members, mayors, commissioners. We don't find people that leave the Denver Regional Council of Government very often. But tonight, we do have a retirement from the group, and it's been our attorney since 1998. So at this point, I'd like to ask Sam Light to come join me, and many of you have seen Sam at uh, workshops and others. So Sam, if you want to come up, please. Thank 
question number 10. I don't drop it. All right, sure, you're going to hand me that thing. Oh, you got it? I knew there was a good reason for having him around. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the Board of Directors, resolution number 10, 2018. A resolution commending Sam Light for his dedicated service to the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Whereas Sam Light has been the Denver Regional Council of Governments Dr. Cog Baggett and respected attorney since 1998. And whereas Sam has provided invaluable briefings, presentation, and insight at Dr. Cog board and committee meetings during his tenure as Dr. Cog's legal counsel. And whereas Sam possesses a reputation for thoroughness, research, enthusiasm, work ethic, and a commitment to regionalism within the metro area. And whereas Sam has been integral in the organization's work through his involvement with restructuring the board, various staff and board trainings, the board code of conduct, contract review, aging service issues, and other matters throughout the years. Now, therefore, it being resolved that the Denver Regional Council of Governments heartily express its gratitude and appreciation to Sam Light for his dedicated and distinguished service to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff. Be it further resolved that the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff extend to Sam Light their best wishes in his new position. Some of you will see him again as general counsel at the Colorado Intergovernmental Risk Sharing Agency, commonly known to U.S. SIRSA. And in future endeavors, resolve, passed, and adopted the 17th day of October 2018 at Denver, Colorado, signed Herb Ashton, Chair, Board of Directors of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Please help me in congratulating Sam. I told you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, some of you who have been here at those five-year ceremonies over the past year have made some comments about this overly expensive clock that you've been getting. <laughs> Let me be the first to tell you, this is your new service awards coming in the future. Right. Mount, Ev Mount, Mount, Mount Evans. Evans. I want to make sure I had the right one because there are two different ones. One is for staff and one is for board members and, and selected individuals. So Sam will be the first recipient of the brand new service award plaque. So, that's so Sam's going to give us a quick introduction of his replacement, and he's going to let her carry the big heavy part. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Directors, thank you very, very much for the recognition. And I'm glad I got this microphone. I didn't want to have Doug hold the microphone anymore for me. <laughs> um, I, I do want to tell you what it's an absolute honor and privilege it has been to serve the Denver Regional Council of Governments for the last uh, 20 years. I very much value the experience. Appreciate working all with, you, with all of you, those that are new or that I haven't met. Uh, maybe that's a good thing that you don't know who your attorney is. That's a sign of a high-functioning organization uh, that we don't meet all that much. Sometimes I would come and do trainings. Um, I only need about an hour tonight. I've got about 75 uh, PowerPoint slides uh, that I'd like to go through uh, for you. But uh, in all seriousness, I, I greatly valued and appreciated the opportunity to serve the mission and the people of Dr. Cog. Thank you all, directors, officers, staff. Greatly appreciate the opportunity, as, I, as was mentioned, I'm not retiring. Uh, I am going on to serve as general counsel for the Colorado Intergovernmental Risk Sharing Agency. Did want to let you know that my successor will be my former partner, Melinda Culley, who will be available. You'll be in great hands uh, with her. And again, thank you all so very, very much for the opportunity to serve you over these last 20 years. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, moving on. Mr. Executive Director, if you would. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, number of items this evening. First, I have some programmatic notes. Um, I mentioned this last month, and I'll mention it again. The meeting schedule, I'll draw your attention to page four of your agenda. That kind of outlines the, um, uh, the meeting schedule. November, we're changing that around a little bit, um, so please be aware of that. We have moved uh, our regular board meeting back to the to the 28th. 
um, because of the Thanksgiving Day uh, holidays. Um, and also notice in the peony and work session, um, they're moving from the 7th to the 14th. But also notice we're changing the time of that because of room availability. We're flipping the meeting time. So peony will be at 4, and the uh, work session will meet at 6. So just FYI. But we'll send you plenty of notice to let you know about all that. Speaking of November meetings, uh, the Finance and Budget Committee, the Performance and Engagement Committee, the Board, and the Chair will each select a member to the nominating committee. Uh, so if directors are interested in serving on the nominating committee, please let Connie know by November 5th. Uh, member representatives wishing to serve on the nominating committee must have been on the board for at least a year. Uh, alternates may not serve on the nominating committee. Um, members of the nominating committee will serve for, for one year until the, or until the new committee is seated. Um, also, you'll be receiving a memo from our board chair um, uh, to all member representatives asking them uh, if they're interested in serving on the executive committee. So be, uh, be looking for that here in the next few days, in next week. Um, so I had, the, I had the pleasure of attending the, um, our National Association, the National Association of Regional Councils, and I know Nicholas knows about them, um, their executive directors conference, conference last week in Cleveland. And uh, I just wanted to share with you, I, I, I'll be honest, I was like a rock star at that place. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me whenever I go away, especially at events like this, how much attention and appreciation my peers have for the good work that Dr. Cog is doing. I'm not just blowing smoke. I mean, that's true. Uh, it, 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 seriously, it was amazing to me. They have profound interest in some of the programs that we have going on. They have profound interest in MetroVision. Um, for you know, for for obvious reasons, we're obviously very proud of it. They also the other uh, the other um, um, the other program initiative that they were really interested in was mobility choice. And I think everybody right now is struggling, like this region is and this state is, with you know how techno what role technology will play in helping us um, mitigate the mobility problems that we're expecting to have. Um, in the near future. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Hey, listen, anytime I can go and look like a rock star, that ain't a bad thing. A <laughs> um, few transportation notes. Our regional active transportation plan that we provided you a briefing at the work session uh, earlier this month. Um, that will be going out for 30-day uh, public comment. And once that's released, and, and we will bring a revised document back through our committee starting with TAC in December. So you will see it all again in January. Um, mobility choice. I mentioned that we had a mobility choice uh, board workshop yesterday, uh, and that's made up of um, the three public agencies that it, that were funding partners in that: ourselves, uh, RTD, and CDOT, as well as private sector members um, led by the Denver Metro Chamber. And uh, we had a tremendous dialogue about. We're starting to put together the document now. So the the main purpose of that meeting was to um, begin to explore and decide which tactical actions. And there were, at one time, over, there were like 128 of them. Um, which tactical actions um, make the cut and were, are actually put into the document? We had a tremendous conversation. It was one of the best sessions we've had thus far as part of the blueprint. So um, you'll see a version of that document um, as early as December, but probably more likely in January. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Metrovision Idea Exchange. We're going virtual with that to, to some degree, at least on certain topics. Um, so at your table, you'll see a handout for the up, uh, an upcoming webinar called Train, Transit Oriented Data, Resources for the Denver Metro Area. And we've had tremendous success with the in-person in Metrovision Idea Exchanges. And if you haven't been to those, I would encourage you strongly to attend. Um, you know, really based, all the topics have been fabulous, but encourage your staff definitely to, to come. Um, but with, we did have requests for a bunch of additional topics, and some of those are more well suited for for webinar. So, um, so this is one that we're going to do a webinar based uh, approach. So please mark your calendars and share this information with your jurisdictional staff, uh, particularly the planners within your your jurisdictions and other interested parties. Um, so the event is going to be held on Halloween on October 31st from 11 to noon, and uh, we'll be sh we're sharing some important information focused on all the dates. And um, um, and we will have um, 
transit-oriented development in the region will be discussed as part of that as well. So if you have any specific information, please contact uh, Brad Calvert on our staff or Kevin Priestley, and they'll be able to uh, um, direct you in the right place. So um, you also have at your table a, uh, a one-page flyer about this Waze carpooling. Everybody, anybody heard about this? So we were, we were fortunate to be involved in, um, in a uh, press conference associated with this uh, last week, I believe. Um, Steve, Steve Erickson and, and the group from Way to Go team, team were participated in the launch of, uh, at Google Boulder's office. Um, Ashley Stolzman, Director Stolzman, she participated um, on behalf of leadership, so we thank her for that. Her was supposed to be there, he couldn't find it. <coughs> Literally, couldn't find a place to park. <laughs> After 30 trips around the building, I gave up, went on. <laughs> no, but it had really good press coverage. Uh, ABC, CBS, Denver Post, Daily Camera were all there. Um, it's a very, it's a new dynamic carpool application. Allows drivers and riders to connect with just a few clicks. It's very sim similar to um, TNC applications, Lyft and, and Uber. So it's very dynamic. We're very happy to have this as an addition, additional commute option in this region. So if you have any questions about that, please contact Steve Erickson. Gotober. Uh, I mentioned last month that this is uh, this is an event we do for the this is the third or fourth year, Steve. Fourth year we've done this where we um, uh, we partnered with 56 co companies around the region to reduce our non SO, uh, reduce our SOV trips um, uh, during the month of October, and we're on pace for to uh, to meet our goal of of, uh, of reducing our SOV trips by 40,000. We're uh, tracking at about 20, just over 20,000 trips right now, halfway through, so that's a good sign. With Dr. Cog, ourselves are in second place in this competition behind Gusto, uh, but ahead of such heavyweights as uh, Google Boulder and uh, DaVita, so that's a good thing. Lifelong Colorado follow-up. I mentioned this last uh, month as well. Um, I mostly just wanted to give you all a heads up that tomorrow you, you will re be receiving an invitation uh, to attend a, uh, the Colorado Age-Friendly Communities Conference that Dr. Cog is hosting here in this room on November 1st. Um, so, so please, if you're interested in that event, uh, you know, please attend. We're, we, it's getting a lot of attention right now, so if you, if you are interested, when you get that email, please click on that link and, uh, and uh, RSVP your attendance, because I'm fearful that we're going to get filled up before, before you all get an opportunity to do that. And Mr. Chairman, I think I will leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Right here. Turn to your right. Over there. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, Doug, were you going to give the details on the clock trade-in program? Yeah. <laughs> so at the executive committee meeting today, when I when I showed the new new thing we could give out for five year awards for your service and all that kind of thing, Bob was the most vocal about what in the heck? How come I had to have this old clock? So uh, no, there's not a not, there's not a uh, such a program. But I will tell you a little bit about the award. I'd like to call the question. <laughs> So this new award, it's a, it's a Colorado artist, and he used um, uh, beetle kill wood to generate these. So uh, as the chairman mentioned, for service awards for our board, it will be Mount Evans. For our staff re recognition of service awards, it will be um, Long's Peak. So it's pretty cool. We, th we thought it was a good addition, better than the clocks. I swore I was never going to give out another clock. <laughs> but for Bob, we would make a special deal on selling you a new version. <laughs> I, and you can still keep the clock. I'll whittle you one, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next item. Public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board time, will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and then action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. At this time, I would invite anyone from the public who has any comments they'd like to do to come to the podium. You can all take a number and we'll just get you lined up here right behind Jerry. Yeah, yeah, and Jerry, you just stay there. All right, moving on to the next item. Let me explain what's going on. So because you are all so good about showing up tonight, 
executive committee has been trying to figure a way that we can guarantee that we're going to have something more interesting for you. So this is one opportunity, and the next person who is going to be afforded this great opportunity, or you may want to say the next victim, is going to be drawn out of a fishbowl in just a minute. <laughs> but there had to be somebody to go first, and my staff was volunteered, and I was calling around tonight saying, who's coming? What are they doing? Who is it? I couldn't find out. But they finally showed up, and I recognized the person. So that was even better. But uh, we hope to try to continuously look for improvement. Now, one of the things that, uh, as Jerry and some of the rest of them have been helping us discuss is, how do we get more participation? How do we get people here and make it interesting for them to be here? One of the things that we are discussing, and all of these are on the table, there is no decision been made. Should we cut the workshops down to less than one a month? Should we cut them down to something on a quarterly basis? But whatever we need to do on the board nights, especially, we need to have the largest amount of participation we can. If you can't make it as a voting member, send your alternate. Please make sure they know. Because the decisions that we make here drive what's happening and how Dr. Cog is represented, not only in your region, but through the state. And as Doug has indicated, other groups watch us very closely as to what we're doing as a collective group. So it's very important that we have people here and we don't have to put things aside because we can't get a quorum. That's devastating. But tonight is a good example of people who really understand the importance of coming tonight, being a part of it. If you're not the voting member, you're here as an alternate. Thank you all for responding to their calls for being here tonight that we sent out. So with that, let me welcome John Hall, who is right here, John. John is the Economic Development Director for the City of Westminster, and I have no idea what he's giving out, so whatever it is, it's got to be good. <laughs> John, you're on your own. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of directors, I should say. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the future of Westminster. I'm going to take about 10 minutes is all. I was uh, asked to be as brief as I could, and, and I will be. Um, so the image on your right is a rendering of uh, what will be the downtown Westminster once it is built and it's currently under construction. The image on the left is a rendering of a rail station uh, on the B line uh, at about 69th and Federal that opened in 2017. So I'm going to talk about those two projects in particular. Let's start with the city's vision, which is becoming the next urban center of the Front Range. Uh, in particular, in italics, you'll see that we wish to be a dynamic community with distinct neighborhoods and a resilient local economy. And both of these projects contribute to that vision. So I'll start with the downtown Westminster project. This is the former Westminster Mall. Some of you may remember it at US 36 and, and Sheridan Boulevard. That's 105 acres. It was built in 1976, 1.2 million square feet. By the late 90s, anchors were leaving the tent, were leaving the mall to go up to Broomfield and be in flat irons and those kinds of things. And the mall really fell into decline. So we had a choice to make as a community. And in the early 2000s, we decided to buy this site and redevelop it as our downtown. Uh, as I said, it's 105 acres. To give you an idea of the scale, that's what happens if you overlay Lodo on this site. So you can see Coors Field at the north end of this frame. That's 22 blocks of downtown Denver, just to give you a sense of how big this site is. US 36 runs on the uh, eastern boundary of the site. You can see in the lower right, before you get to some of those specific images, the Sheridan Bus Rapid Transit uh, Station, which is the second busiest in the region. So our vision for the site includes two to three million square feet of office space, 750,000 square feet of retail, 2,300 residential apartments, 300 rooms of hotels, I think will exceed all of these numbers, uh, several civic and cultural uses, and 18 acres of parks and open space. Here's a rendering of, generally speaking, the massing uh, for that property. You're looking off to the north. You can see the uh, in bright yellow the link to the Sheridan uh, Bus Rapid Transit Station, and a link to the south to Future Rail. Um, also existing today is the US 36 bike trail, which runs 
on the um, eastern edge of the site right along uh, US 36 and on the eastern edge of the development property. We have uh, eight projects underway. Uh, uh, currently, that uh, equates to a million square feet of space and a quarter of a billion dollars of investment. So we're well underway. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of those projects very briefly. The first one I'd like to talk about is an affordable housing project. This is 118 units with 20,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. It wraps the parking garage uh, that serves the first phase of the site and serves income levels up to 60% of area median income. All the projects we're building on this site uh, will be meeting uh, LEED Silver standards or higher. Uh, this is uh, First Hotel, which is uh, breaking ground, I think, next month, 125 units. The Origin Hotel being done by the same developer that uh, recently opened the Red Rocks Hotel, for those of you who are familiar with that. The Ascent Westminster is uh, represented by the blue blocks in the lower portion of this frame. Um, that is uh, about 255 units in the lower portion, another uh, 225 units in the upper portion indicated as B3. Those are uh, market rate rental uh, units. 10% of which will be affordable workforce housing units. Um, so we're, we're very focused on making sure that we are building in affordable units as we attract uh, private investment. Here's a rendering of that project. Uh, this will be opening in the second quarter of 2019. They have topped out. They're doing uh, exterior uh, finishes now and working on the interiors of the project. This is the second uh, project that will sit on our central square known as the Aspire project. And we are currently in uh, final negotiations, expect the land transaction to close uh, before the end of the year. Uh, as I said, 226 units. Uh, this will also have a large market hall at the ground level. Alamo Draft House is building another theater um, at uh, downtown Westminster. This is scheduled for a second quarter opening as well. We're excited about this project. And then tomorrow night, we will be opening our central square, our 1.2-acre uh, central square, which will really kind of serve as the living room for the project. Uh, and um, it's coming along very nicely. We are uh, hosting an event on Saturday, just to give you an idea of, of how much this, how much character this site still retains for the community. We're holding a harvest festival this weekend. Last year, we had 17,000 people in attendance. We're expecting 30,000 this year. So it's a fairly big uh, event. The second project I'd like to talk about is Westminster Station, which is our first uh, rail stop, 15 minutes from Union Station. So we like to say it's closer to Denver than most of Denver is to Union Station. Um, and <clears throat> I had a little bit of spin in there anyway. Um, it's, it's located, uh, just, to, just to orient you a little bit, uh, Federal Boulevard running up the right side of the screen. Um, between 69th and 72nd is roughly the, the transit-oriented district. And for most people I have found, this is sort of a, a bit of a hole in their cognitive map about this region. It's not a place that people uh, have the opportunity to go to very often. I would encourage you to take a ride up. It is a short distance. And I think you'll see just how close it is um, to downtown Denver. So we are working hard on redeveloping this area as well. Here's a view from the platform looking back to the parking garage located in this area. When RTD first approached us, their, um, their plans called for surface parking. And we decided that we wanted to preserve development opportunity in this area. And so we partnered uh, with them to construct a parking garage so as to preserve developability uh, in this area. Um, so some of the highlights of the area, very briefly, uh, the ridership, number one, uh, continues to be about double uh, RTD's original projections, which we're very excited about. We'll see how that is changed once the G line opens. Um, this is also, this site is also on the regional bike trail, so you can ride the Clear Creek, Creek Trail um, to, the, to this location. Um, we 
Several of you are probably familiar with Opportunity Zones, which are part of the latest economic uh, stimulus activities that provide tax benefits, deferred capital gains taxes. This area it has been designated as an Opportunity Zone. Um, this is a redevelopment site in a different way. We don't own most of the land in this area. So um, redevelopment will happen somewhat organically. The first project um, out of the ground that is currently open is a 70-unit affordable housing project that was done in partnership with Unison Housing Partners, formerly Adams County Housing Authority. And um, they have about 6,000 square feet of commercial space in addition to the affordable housing uh, units. And it filled up, uh, actually, I think, the building was full before the grand opening took place. Um, and all of you know how dire the need is for affordable housing. Um, second project we're working on is one that will wrap that parking garage that I just showed to you. Uh, and we're working with a development company by the name of Regeneration. They're proposing 120 uh, market rate units for this area. So our challenge here is a little bit different. Uh, it qual this area qualifies um, for affordable housing, but there's already um, quite a few units of affordable housing in the area. We're trying to stimulate some market rate housing in this uh, particular area adjacent to uh, the station. The other thing we're doing is, is looking for unique businesses and unique opportunities in this area. We have um, a 40-year-old recording studio in this area, Colorado Sound Studios, which records national acts, many of which you would know. They are interested in both expanding their recording services and getting into education and workforce development in the recording industry. So we're working closely with them on their expansion. Um, we bought the adjacent building next door and we'll be accommodating their expansion here in the near future. We're working with a number of other local businesses, um, Goody's Restaurant on the left and uh, Girls Auto Garage on the right, fairly unique businesses in this area. We um, are working very hard to hang on to some of those um, unique uses that give some character to this area that's different from other parts of the city. Finally, I, I want to highlight the Westminster Station Park, which is a 40-acre regional park on the uh, south side of the station. Um, it will be built in multiple phases and include a nature playground which uh, was designed in conjunction with the local STEM school and which we're very excited about. So with that, I just wanted to highlight a couple of projects, invite you to ask any questions, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Ms. Castle, come do me a favor, please. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> this is so that there is no bias in who gets to be the very next person up. She is not one of our voting members and has no uh, springs about who she pulls out. No, 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 let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. That's what happens when you're not here. Oh, we have a primary and a backup. We will, uh, Connie, will we reach out to them? I'm not glad I didn't have to draw this. <laughs> You're right with you, Kevin. Hang on just a second. Okay. So one of the things that I want to, uh, as John pointed out, this park that we're building is being one of the largest parks outside of Confluence Park in Denver. But it's our partners, Adams County, Adams County Open Space, RTD, CDOT, and Urban Drainage are all partners in this park. And this is not a city of Westminster Park. This is a regional park. So we have stuff in Denver. We have unincorporated Adams County. We have Arvada. All touch the borders of this park area. 
we've got about another two years worth of construction to get the thing totally done. But a lot of the stuff, uh, GOCO has also been a big part of what was in there. We've had several grants from them. So this is what happens when you have partnerships like Dr. Cog, because it's through those partnerships that we're able to finish out what John described as our TOD station. Currently the only station operating on the B line. Bill. <laughs> not, not to dig, but Bill. <laughs> we're looking for the next two, three, four, five, all the way to Longmont. <clears throat> so eventually what we hope to do is uh, have a bigger grand opening, but as John said, our downtown will be uh, open to all of you on Saturday from 12 to 8. Uh, bands, food trucks, entertainment, and a balloon lighting. We hope to have about half a dozen uh, hot air balloons there for a glow for the night. So we ask you to bring your families. This is a family event. Parking is a garage to park in. So we've got a little over a thousand spots in the parking garage. So please, if you're free and you have time, good weather is forecast. If the weather goes bad, Tina Francone owns the bad part because it's in Jefferson <laughs> County. <laughs> but, Eva. Yeah, I, I just want to say how wonderful this area is. It's, it's an incredible jewel to the community. I look forward to it being completed so I can spend my money in Westminster. And you know, coming from Thornton, that's really hard for me to do. So, but I am really looking forward to it. And it, it truly is a partnership. Um, a lot of the money that Adams County was able to give at, at the county itself was able to, to give to Westminster come from our ta tax, open space and park tax. We give out over $60 million a year and money to, for grants um, that go out. And every city that sits here that live, that's in Adams County has received money from, from that tax um, for their parks and open space. Adams County has an amazing amount of parks and open space in every municipality. So I'm looking forward to spending money and having beer with her, her. But do you drink beer? I've never seen you with beer. I've seen you with, uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, whiskey or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're working on you. Yeah, yeah, but not from the beer. Mr. Flynn, you had a comment. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I actually just want to congratulate uh, you, Mayor, and your whole city staff and everybody who worked on this. I had the pleasure of being at RTD on the Eagle Project and the initial plan for that station. Uh, you wouldn't believe, I'm just blown away when my wife and I drove through there recently to see the remarkable changes, especially the park. Uh, but everything that's gone on there is so much more remarkable than it would have been with j at just the beginning of our Eagle Project and the B Line. But you have taken that station and really upped your game and elevated the profile of the station and you've capitalized on it in a way that really makes should make all of us jealous and I really want to congratulate you for it. Well just on, on make that note John Hall is off limits to anybody you've represented in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I stole him back from Parker already and he's not going in again. John, leave him alone. Uh, we, we also want to acquire John Hall for our presentation if that's okay. <laughs> Since he is familiar with Parker. Well, since he's familiar, we will, we will do an IGA with you. <laughs> All right, John, again, thank you for coming down tonight. I appreciate it. All right, moving on. Uh, at this time, we would open the uh, ground floor for a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So moved. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we will go on. Our infamous Mr. Rick Morrow, Rich, Rich Morrow, sorry, Rick, Rich. I will tell you that uh, because a session is not in going on right now, you would think they have nothing to do. But we have even more going on now than we would if the legislature was in session that is so much more critical to what's going on in Colorado. So, Mr. Morrow, bring us up to date. Well, I first want to know why I'm infamous. <laughs> <laughs> There's something I did that I've I I've been over to Capitol a lot. I've heard your name a lot. I don't remember, but. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I believe we have uh, the agenda item for uh, consideration of motions on uh, ballot measures uh, and specifically uh, Proposition 110 that was forwarded uh, or recommended from the board last month to be put back on uh, for this month. Um, I know that We've had, uh, or the board has had uh, several conversations 
uh, about uh, this particular issue as well as the other ballot measures uh, at a work session, last month's board meeting at least, and then again tonight. Um, and I don't, so I don't know if I need to say a whole lot more. I think most of you know the issues, um, have probably heard it either here, heard it in probably just about everywhere else you've gone in the last couple of months. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about 110 or any of the other ballot measures. We did, I will add, we did, the board, uh, you may recall, did take a position opposing uh, Amendment 74 uh, last month. And um, so with that, I'll just uh, open it up and see if there's uh, a motion to be made or, or comments or questions. How much are questions on anything that Mr. Morrow is going to be representing or any questions to any of the issues that uh, we have or have not taken a position on tonight? Are you okay? Ms. Peck? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know uh, what you think of the article in the Denver Post this morning about 110 being behind 109, and do you think that survey is accurate? It made me a little nervous. Yeah, I, I'm not really qualified to say if it's accurate or not, but it was a surprise to me. Yeah, that's really pretty much all I can say at this point. Yeah. I imagine there's more polling to come, so we'll see if that changes. Mr. Flynn? Uh, if I could just comment on that, if I recall the article correctly, the poll, there were two different polls. There was an internal poll on 109 that, of course, showed it favorable, and the other poll was a more general poll on 110 that showed it unfavorable. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd, just to get it on the floor, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the Dr. Cog board endorse and support uh, Proposition 110. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Mr. Flynn? The reason I believe we ought to uh, support 110, at least over 109, if we don't outright oppose 109, is that I personally I believe that 109 is not only about roads, it's not, and not primarily about roads. It's about uh, shifting other spending at the state level away from K-12, higher ed, health care, and other general fund needs because it forces the state to go into debt and to repay it from those other revenues. And so in a time of a recession, which is inevitable, uh, we are going to face not only some hard choices, but some, some, uh, some real Hobson's choices if, uh, um, if 109 were to pass. And so if we don't outright oppose 109, we at least ought to strongly support uh, the first real new revenue for uh, mobility, not just roads, but total mobility since, uh, since Tabor since 92 and the gas tax last went up. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Uh, I just wanted to speak in favor of the motion as well. This is totally in Dr. Cog's wheelhouse. We have policy longstanding to support additional funds for transportation. Um, the, the 110 measure would provide um, multimodal funds, it would provide funds to local governments for local pro priorities, as well as um, take a big chunk out of the CDOT backlog for priorities. This is exactly what we've been wanting and pushing for for years. As to whether or not the polls are accurate, um, I think what we do know is that these next three weeks will be crucial and Dr. Cog's support and, and which I hope we will get tonight, and the fact that so many cities and counties in the metro area would support this, I think would help um, create some momentum around, yes, we need to make this investment in mobility for the state of Colorado. Other comments? Yeah. Thank you. I'd like also to speak in favor of this motion. The city of Lone Tree came in in, fa in favor of the motion. What I think is important about it is it is uh, a source of funding from both tourists and electric or hybrid car drivers who use the roads but um, traditionally don't pay for them or as much as those of us who drive in non-hybrids or non-electric cars. Thank you. Other comments? Ms. Francone, 
think that was your hand up. Thank you, sir. Um, just since I wasn't present at the last meeting, I'm reading the minutes from the last meeting. Um, there was a similar motion brought last meeting, and it was it failed. Is that correct? It got no. It did not have enough votes one way or another. So that's why we had to bring it back. If you take some, we have a, a requirement. We have a certain number of people who have to vote, and that's based upon membership, not those present. And we didn't have enough to go one way or the other. Thank you. But there were a number of people who abstained because they had not talked to their local elected bodies. But I would ask you to consider this. You're here to represent Dr. Cog for the region, not necessarily whether your city or county took a position. So I would ask you to consider that uh, Make a decision one way or the other. If you can't vote for it, vote against it. But um, we still have to think about what we're doing here as a region and not necessarily what just our city or our county takes place. I have voted down here in opposition to what my council is taking place because this is a regional issue. It's not just a, an issue of my particular city or, or my county. So I would ask you to think about that when it comes time to take the vote. We do have a requirement of a minimum we have to have 30 as a minimum number to move this forward. We did not have enough to go one way or the other last time because the motion was one way, but we had, did not have a quorum. That's one of the reasons that the board officers are out calling everybody to say, we need enough to show up to at least get a quorum, whether it passes or fails. But we still need enough people here to, to call for a vote. Any other comments that you have? Yes, sir. Since it's my first meeting, do alternates vote? Very good. If, they are, if the primary is not here. Good. Um, if it's okay, I would like to speak briefly to the motion. I also will support it. Um, we very much look forward to interconnecting Boulder with cities like Brighton and putting funding towards Highway 7, connecting with Longmont, uh, putting money towards Highway 119. These are mobility issues that are region-wide. They are not just city issues. And so it seems appropriate to me that this body would be in support of funding for regional interconnections. Thanks, Mr. Weaver. Mr. Pfeiffer, you had a comment. My comment is, since my mayor did the presentation, I think Arvada will be supporting it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're going to have to go talk to him if you don't. He's in Africa, so I don't have to worry too bad. Not worry. Well, you got a few days rest, but then. All right. Any other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Ramson. Maybe this is a question um, you can answer. <laughs> I think, I, in general, I support this, and I think our town definitely supports this. But I, I guess I'm curious about the shift from an excise tax based funding for transportation to a generalized sales tax funding. For transportation is that something that's popular now because I get the HEV and the more fuel efficient vehicles and the move away from excise taxes but is this what everybody's doing is going to a sales tax to fund their roads how are how is the broader world dealing no with I, I don't think that that I mean I think it varies from state to state um, what happened with this one was basically as I understand it that uh, preliminary polling showed that the sales tax pulled better than in just about any other option. So Margo, let me bring you back to a little bit. This is a five-year effort. This is not something that just came up. But we've looked at, as many of you discussed, gas tax hasn't been raised in over 20 years. Even if we were to raise the gas tax, not everybody is paying into it. Property tax pulled worse than gas tax did. So you don't have a lot of options left so this what is proposed was what was proposed actually two years ago by metro mayors by the same statewide coalition that's supporting it today and putting a lot of money into the ads uh, the governor is not cheap to get him to do commercials but i would tell you that uh, we have an opportunity that i'm afraid if we don't be six aren't successful this year I don't know of any of the groups involved in the statewide coalition who are committed that if they don't make it this year, they'll come back next year. This is two years in a row they've done huge amounts of fundraising and, and putting into this. I don't know where it would go after this, and I don't know that there's any option, but I think uh, Mr. Flynn indicated the general fund is not there. We've seen that, and, and I am scared to death of what happens if we have failure of 110 and 109 passes, because I don't know how the state's going to fund mental health and child care and other things like that that we're going to see. Senior impacted. services. Senior citizens, all that. Yeah, Rich and I are in that group. 
All right, final round. Any other comments or questions? When we call the vote, I need you to hold your hands up high, and we have three people counting. And again, we must have a minimum of 30 for this to move forward or to fail, whichever way it goes. So at this point, all those in favor of the motion, please hold your hands up and keep them up till we tell you to drop them. F38. Thank you all. So upon that tally, the uh, vote passes, and we will take a position of support for Proposition 110. Next item up. I got this. This is the uh, discussion on amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program. Mr. Cottrell, where are we? There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Is there a chance we can take a position on 109? It's an option, yeah. If somebody wants to make that motion, yeah. I'd like to make a motion that Dr. Cog take a position of oppose against Proposition 109. Is there a second to that motion, Mr. Flynn? Making the second? Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second for an opposition to 109. Is there any discussion by any member of the, of the group? Ms. Jones. Well, just to speak to the motion, um, as I think um, Director Flynn pointed out, there is no revenue source to pay back the bonds under um, 109, which means that we're looking at unidentified cuts to other state programs, which could be education, health care, senior services, mental health, you name it. Um, and it would also decrease the amount of um, the Senate Bill 1 bonds by um, negating the final years of that. So, and I guess the, the additional issue with that um, is that there, even though the uh, project list for 109 is in the ballot for um, over $5 billion worth of projects, the actual bonding amount would be a roughly $2 billion, which means, A, it's disingenuous because a good chunk of the portion of the projects listed wouldn't be able to be built. Um, some counties are completely left out. I know there's nothing in it for Arapahoe at all. There's very little in it for Boulder County. There's nothing for transit at all. In fact, it's prohibited. And there's no money going to local governments. And so for all those reasons, um, I, I think Dr. Cog should oppose 109. Other comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 109 is like a household buying two new cars on a, on a bank loan and pledging its grocery money toward the payment. OK. Other comments or questions from any member of the group? No other comments? All right. Same. Uh, yeah. I would agree that um, 109 is a bad idea, considering that I'm going to be spending this weekend at the Colorado Association of School Boards as a delegate, a voting delegate. So we're not taking money from kids. That's a bad idea. And so I think it's a bad idea all the way around because public education, kindergarten programs, special ed could be cut. And then who's going to pay for that? So. Again, other comments or questions? Same rule applies. In order to move this forward, we must have a minimum of 30 votes. So if you are in support of the motion to uh, provide an opinion of opposed for Proposition 109, please hold your hands. We'll go again.
All right, motion carries with 35 positive votes. All right, moving on, Mr. Cottrell, we'll try again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. So these are amendments, uh, policy amendments to the 1821 uh, Transportation Improvement Program. There are seven total amendments this evening for your consideration. Uh, the first two um, deal with the 2013 flood event, where Regions 1 and 4 are receiving additional um, federal emergency funding um, to complete uh, flood repairs. Uh, region 4 is receiving an additional $30 million for State Highway 7, and Region 1 is receiving an additional $11 million for repairs to State Highway 72. Uh, the third amendment for your consideration is a CDOT Region 1 project on I-25. Uh, it's the north managed lanes from 120th to State Highway 7. There is a request for additional funding to cover additional lighting and median work. The last four amendments uh, move funding from various CDOT TIP projects into the Wadsworth Boulevard widening from 35th to 48th Avenue. And this is to better show all funding sources going into the project. So those are the seven amendments um, this evening for your consideration and happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. This is a backup. The RTC considered this yesterday morning and it passed this on a unanimous vote. Other comments for Mr. Cottrell? If there is no uh, other comments, will you, uh, anyone like to make the motion as it is just defined in the uh, staff of memorandum agenda? Plan? Okay, the motion is to approve the attached amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program. Do I have a second? second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you're you. You're on for the next one. Um, so this item deals with TIP FY18 um, projects that are delayed for a second year. So the adopted 16 through 21 TIP policy, and just as a reminder, this is not the TIP policy that was just adopted this last July, but was adopted four years ago, which covers um, fiscal year 16 through 19. Uh, it states that project phases that are delayed for a second year are uh, allowed to appeal to the board for a variance to continue. Uh, if that phase is still delayed and therefore not initiated by October 15th, um, just two days ago. Um, so attachment one within your agenda outlines the uh, project delays policy within the 1621 TIP policy. So Dr. Cog's staff reviewed the status of all the project phases that received a first year delay last year for 2017. And so after consulting with our project partners and uh, project staff, uh, we determined that two projects uh, continue to have delayed project phases and therefore were not initiated by this last uh, October 15th. Um, these two projects include the 72nd and Colorado Station sidewalks sponsored by uh, Commerce City. Uh, this project would add sidewalks, drainage improvements, and street lighting on Colorado from 70th to 72nd. Um, so the project phase that is actually delayed for a second year is construction, meaning that Commerce City would need to have this project advertised for construction to no, no, no longer be delayed. Uh, the second project that is delayed for a second year is the 16th Street Mall reconstructed, uh, sponsored by RTD. Uh, this project reconstructs one block of the mall from Lawrence to Arapaho. Uh, the project phase that is delayed for a second year is construction. Um, so in a, in a typical construction project, this would mean um, that the project would need to advertise for construction. Uh, however, this is a design-build project. So in this matter, uh, RTD would need to advertise the RFQ to any interested design build contracting teams. Um, Dr. Cog's staff feels that this is appropriate and consistent with the existing policy language. Uh, so as outlined in each of the attached letters, which those are included in attachment two and three, um, Commerce City and RTD each wish to appeal to the board and continue their projects. Uh, the TIP policy outlines that there's two options for the board to consider. Um, the first would be to deny their appeals, uh, and therefore any unspent funding would need to be re, um, would be turned back to Dr. Cog for future reprogramming. Uh, the second option to the board is to allow a variance of up to 120 days from this last October 1st. Um, so that would take us up to January 29th of this coming year. Uh, and again, if that deadline deadline is not met by the sponsor of January 29th, if 120 day variance is awarded, all the federal funding that is unspent would be returned back to Dr. Cog. 
Um, so the staff recommendation is to approve a 120-day variance on both of these uh, projects to allow them to continue. And uh, at this time, the chair would allow, uh, we would give uh, each project sponsor the opportunity to either comment on the appeal or answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Mr. Teeter and Ms. Smith, you two seem to be involved in the first one. Any comments or anything you'd like to add? Yes, I have a uh, um, director tonight, Ms. Michelle Halstead, here to represent the city on this comment. Okay. Ms. Halstead, if you would, please. <laughs> Members of the board, Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. On behalf of Commerce City, I respectfully appeal to the board and request a 120-day extension for our Colorado Boulevard Station sidewalk project. The city takes full responsibility for the delay, which was a result of two unanticipated factors. First, our Public Works Department experienced significant staff turnover, including the director this year, um, which contributed to the delay. And secondly, our initial right-of-way acquisition cost for 72nd Avenue, which was additional scope that we had added to this project, came in significantly higher than the budget. So we actually had to um, uh, change our scope and then also address and change the design of the project. So that also contributed to the delay. Um, since May, the city has worked diligently to get this project back on track. We actually held our 90% design review meeting with the Colorado Department of Transportation on August 7th, and we submitted our final designs to CDOT on September 24th for their concurrence to award. So we're currently waiting for final approval from CDOT, and as the staff report indicates, CDOT anticipates issuing that concurrence to advertise in the November-December timeframe. So we're very confident by working with all of our partners that we can um, advertise this project within the 120-day extension, and we respectfully ask for your support. Working Smith, anything you can add from the CDOT side? Uh, nothing additional to add other than that is my understanding as well as I was briefed that in the November, December time period approved. I don't see any issues with any potential oh. delays this, this time. Okay. Mr. Pfeiffer, you had a comment. Well, for those that know, I always struggle with these, so I have to make a comment. Um, what happened the first year when you were warned that you're a one-year delay already? Now we're on year two delay. I didn't hear any comments made around the first year and why you didn't get a lot of this work done the first time. The first year, thank you, Director, the first year we had some IGA challenges that were delayed um, with the department, and so it, it delayed our starting design and engineering work primarily. We also had uh, ongoing staffing challenges um, first year as well, which we continued to have. Do you believe that giving you 120 days uh, will give you the room to get this back on track? after two years? Yes, Director, because the final step is CDOT's concurrence to award, and then we have a bid package uh, ready to go out on the street. Thank you. Other comments from anybody on the board? I have a recommendation for approval of the 120-day extension, and folks, this is extension two. They're not likely to be supported for a third. At this point in time, I would entertain a motion for one way or the other. Ms. Dolsman? Thank you. I make a motion to recommend the extension for the Commerce City project. Um, and if there's a second, I'd like to speak to the motion. Okay. Do I have a second? Mr. Flynn, thank you. All those in favor, aye. There's a motion. There's a discussion. Yes, sorry. I was, I was just going to comment that um, you know these are very serious because a lot of people submitted good projects in the tip process. Um, and so, like, for example, the city of Louisville, which I represent, um, was not awarded any funding in the TIP process. And we had some really good projects that were ready to go. So we all know construction escalation, what it's done. We all know how tight the labor market is. So it is very serious as these things delay and get pushed further out. It costs other people real dollars as well. I think at this point in time, it seems like the most fiscally responsible thing to do is to approve this project so that we don't delay funding another project even further. It sounds like this is ready to go. And um, I look forward to seeing it done. Pfeiffer? I'll make the comment that, you know, um, we see it a third time, I'm sure it'll be a no. Um, 
but uh, I'll go ahead and support it this one time for uh, the four months extension. Other Three comments? Months. No four months. All right, I'll go back to the vote again. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hey, folks, let's make it happen. Moving on to the second one, 16th Street Mall reconstruction. Mr. Ben Meter, I'm going to turn to you because this has got your name on it. <coughs> Thank you, Chair and Board. I'm changing my role um, to speak to you tonight on this matter. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, um, speak to you um, and request your support for RTDs and the City and County of Denver's variance request for the 16th Street Mall reconstruction TIP project. So consistent with Dr. Cog policy, that's why we are here tonight. And you have the letter in your package and specifically we are requesting a 120 day extension similar to the one you just granted. Also joining me to support this request is Brian Pinkerton who is the principal project manager on this project for the city and county of Denver. So a little background for me and uh, Brian will wrap it up. Subsequent to the award of the TIP funding, RTD in Denver agreed to a study that is resulting in a redesign of the full mall from Civic Center to Market Street Station and to perform the accompanying work for environmental clearance under the NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. This effort allowed us to proceed with the best design and layout for the 35-year-old facility and address the rapidly escalating infrastructure maintenance costs for the mall, which is reaching the end of its useful life. RTD and Denver have been working diligently to keep the project moving forward. However, given the amount of public concern for the future of the facility, we have included an extensive public and stakeholder involvement component to assure a successful project with strong support. We're confident that the added time spent in planning, design, and environmental review process to date over the past two years has positioned us to complete the work within this 120-day extension that we're requesting. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Pinkerton, who can provide you with more on the project, our next steps, and a schedule that's consistent with our request for the extension. Thank you, members of the board, for hearing us this evening. Uh, the City of Denver has been working with our partners at RTD very, very hard to get this environmental assessment to closure. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we are about the last leg of, of wrapping that up. It was particularly complicated because the 16th Street Mall is eligible as a historic resource, which then kicks in all the various federal procedures and requirements to deal with a historic resource. But we feel like we have come up with a very good uh, product, and uh, the city of Denver intends to advertise for construction through a design-build process, as Todd laid out, in January of 2019. Um, we have selected design build because we want to tap into the innovation of the private sector on such a large and complicated project and we also believe that that will help us achieve our own deadlines within the city of Denver for completing the project with some of our TIF funds. Uh, the city of Denver is contributing approximately 80 million dollars towards this regionally significant project and we are certainly taking very seriously the obligation to get those funds moving and put into place. Thank you for your consideration. Any other comments, Mr. Van Meter? Any of the representatives from Denver have any comments that they'd like to make? I'll let you guys flip a coin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to reiterate uh, the city's support for this project and what a critical regional asset the 16th Street Mall is. Uh, it is the artery of two of the largest transit stations in the city. Um, and as Brian said, uh, you know, we are very, uh, we take this project very seriously. We take the prospect of the delay and the second strike very seriously. The highest levels of public works and the mayor's office are watching this very closely. And I'm confident with the 120 day delay, we can get this project back on track. And did you also have a comment? I'm not sure uh, Nick answered or gave the, uh, the perspective that I would have given. Uh, the only thing I would add is that the city is adding 
significantly uh, local dollars, bond dollars, CIP dollars to the project to do the complete mall and not just the one block. But this uh, funding here is a crucial uh, part of the capital stack to completing that. The 16th Street Mall serves an enormous number of people from many of the jurisdictions, both north and south, and is a true regional asset. And we all know how much it improved mobility in the core when, when it opened in 1982. Uh, it took all those buses off of the street and, and brought them into then Market and Civic Center Station. Uh, its useful life has run, and it's time to try to cut down on the enormous maintenance costs we have from those granite pavers and, uh, and get on with this. The RFQ will be on the street in January, well within the 120 days. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions from any, any member of the board? Ms. Dolsman. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Van Meter. <clears throat> so um, I first I just want to say I recognize the regional significance of the whole mall project. It is very important. And the historical and architectural significance are also very important to the Denver region. And I don't want to um, have my comment shortchange any of that whatsoever, because it is a very important project. I do have questions on this one block section of the project, because I see the importance in the whole project that Denver's undertaken, moreover. Um, and I understand how that project has sort of impacted this project, but I just am a little bit confused about some of the details. Um, so Mr. Van Meter, my question first is, what year was this um, construction supposed to take place? And then if I read your letter correctly, are you now saying the construction will take place in 2022? The um, construction was supposed to commence in the 2016-2017 time frame. Um, and I give you that broad range because I can't recall exactly. I apologize. And the 2022 date is the target date for completion of the construction. So construction would start um, subsequent to, as Brian Pinkerton um, pointed out, subsequent to procurement of the design build um, <coughs> contractor and um, proceed, in, we anticipate, by starting potentially as early as late 2019 and, compl and cl complete in 2022. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could make a comment. Go ahead. So, I, so we're at the point where now we have a second year delay, so you're kind of put in a pickle of, you know, <coughs> do you roll the money to another project and then it would have to start, and it, there's, it most likely couldn't get ahead of schedule of this project given all the background that this has. But what I think we should do in the future is back on the first year delay, in 2016 when this project was going to be delayed, there was a long waiting list of projects that were potentially shovel ready. And it seems like if we could back the conversation up and talk about these things sooner, we could even make commitments to people and say like, hey, okay, this is a really good project. In 2022, you need funding. By the way, we're going to have new federal dollars in 2022. Let's set aside some money from that tip to fund this project in the future so that we're not holding up 2016 dollars for four or five years. Um, so I guess I'm I, I would rather see things happen differently in the future, and I hope we remember this when we talk about the delay, because we don't have a delay policy for our new TIP process, and I think it's something that is really important, and trying to figure out how we can have conversations sooner on projects that are delayed so the funding can go to projects that are ready to go. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Director Stolpen, your comments are well taken. Um, you will recall that we did have a work session to talk about delay policy for the next tip, and you are correct. We have not developed that policy yet, but one of the discussions we did have is directly related to what you had suggested, is about um, trying to get a better handle on on the delays early in the process. And Todd, you might remember the specific schedule that we had talked about in, in that work session, but it is not to allow it to get to the second year delay point. And at that point, they would, the money would be removed. It wouldn't be this extension concept. So in the future, uh, a project that encounters a first year delay will need to appear before the, you know, yourself and, and basically ask for the project to continue. Um, and if that project is allowed to continue, they would only be allowed up until the following July um, before the potential for funds would be removed. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact policy language, but that's a good summary of that. So, Mr. Chairman, if yeah. I may. Um, so Todd, just to refresh my memory, is that in the, the, the new TIP policy document? Right, and that will start with oh, it FY20. Is. OK, so, so the policy is in place. Other comments or questions? 
Gentlemen, this is uh, one of those, again, this is it. I don't think you'll get a support for a third extension. So please make sure that the targets you're holding are met or please exceed the targets, not by extending, but getting it done sooner. On the board, I have a recommendation for approval of the 16th Street Mall reconstruction application for a 120-day extension. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Mr. Flynn, would you like to make the motion? I was going to ask. No one's made a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion, and I'll add at the risk of uh, being quoted if there's any media in the room. If I could strangle Mr. I am pay, I would do it. <laughs> but he gave us a beautiful mall that is a maintenance nightmare 30-some years ago, and we have to address it now. And it took that much more time because people love the design, but we hate the maintenance costs. And we're hoping that with this gap uh, financing and completing the project and advertising in January, we'll be able to solve all of those problems and keep faithful to IM Pay's design. I'm going to condense that down to you have a motion in favor of the. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion in the second. Is there any further discussion? Again, the motion is in support the 120-day extension for this project. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, gentlemen, you're on the clock. Mr. Calvert, I think you're in the audience somewhere. Good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad Calvert, I am the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division here at Dr. Cog. Thank you for having um, uh, me this evening. Uh, this is an action item in your uh, agenda packet. Um, it really is ultimately a request to the Board to approve eligibility and evaluation criteria uh, used to recommend funding studies under the Stationary Master Plan and Urban Center Set-Aside uh, program that the Board has established um, over, over many years. Um, throughout this presentation, you will see this uh, shorthand of stamp slash UC. I have incorrectly for seven years used UC stamp. So if I say that, it's the same thing. Please don't get confused. <laughs> Apparently, I've been wrong for seven years. So uh, just a little bit of mea culpa there on the, on the front end. Um, this is attachment E um, in your packet. I think the memo starts at page 41 of the, of the electronic packet. Uh, the two items that you're ultimately taking action on are attachments two and three. Um, as noted uh, in the memo, um, RTC considered this uh, item yesterday and did uh, vote to recommend approval uh, to the Board of Directors. Uh, it also comes with a recommendation from the Transportation uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, very brief uh, history, as I mentioned, this has actually been a program that the Board established several TIPS, Transportation Improvement Programs, uh, ago back in 2007. Uh, in the first five years of the program, it was really focused on providing uh, planning support for local communities that were seeing trans transit investments and ultimately having uh, transit stations developed in their communities to sort of build out the sort of land use and planning components uh, necessary to prepare uh, for that change in the community. Uh, back in 2011, the board added urban centers um, as part of the eligible uh, study areas. Um, uh, so in, as, as you see on the bottom of the slide, uh, since 2007, there's been approximately 43 uh, local studies that have been funded uh, through this program. I get the sense that sort of what a station area is probably pretty self-explanatory, but as I mentioned, the board did add urban centers. Uh, urban centers have been a long-standing part of the Metrovision plan. Uh, it was even alluded to um, in the Westminster presentation that, that you saw earlier. Uh, they are, I think it's important to note that these urban centers are, are locally identified and regionally recognized. Uh, so for instance, both of the, of the areas that, that John showed you early in Westminster are designated urban centers within the Metrovision plan. To give you some other examples of places, uh, the board amended Metrovision to expand a few urban center boundaries uh, back in um, April, and that was for the East Colfax Main Street um, Urban Center in Denver, uh, Highlands Ranch Town Center, and um, Inglewood City Center. So that gives you kind of a sense of a representative uh, group of urban centers that are 104 uh, currently recognized uh, in the Metrovision plan. This is just kind of a high level of uh, the eligible study types. There's more details uh, within uh, your attachment. I'm happy to sort of describe any of these or give you examples of, of past studies if that's helpful. 
Um, so these are ultimately what um, these funding, uh, this funding source is, is designed to support. Again, local studies uh, that are that are um, these are examples as to what what are what are eligible. Um, as I've mentioned, this is something that the board has uh, established uh, many years ago, and has ultimately done a couple of uh, calls for studies over over the last uh, decade or so. The last time you did this were for fifth, uh, fiscal year 16 and 17. Uh, these are now for fiscal y fiscal years 18 and 19. Uh, these criteria are pretty similar to what the board uh, took action on and supported uh, last time. The revisions to the criteria in large part uh, reflect some administrative changes to this program overall. Uh, formerly RTD was the primary administrative agency and contracting agency that has actually transferred over uh, to CDOT for fiscal years 18 and 19. So that's some of the changes that really um, are related to that. Uh, so for exam example, one of the things that RTC talked about um, yesterday was this codifying requirement of Dr. Cog's staff serving on a project management team for each of the studies. Uh, CDOT has made it clear they're happy and comfortable uh, administering the, the, the program, but may have a very difficult time doing kind of day-to-day -day project uh, management to work with local sponsors, and Dr. Cog has agreed uh, to play that role. And so we've always had that uh, in the eligibility and evaluation criteria, but we just want to specifically um, call it out this time around. Um, some other changes really kind of related to uh, MetroVision, which obviously was adopted by the board back in January of last year. So a lot, uh, a few changes related to kind of just alignment uh, with, with the plan and using uh, similar language. Uh, you will note uh, in the evaluation criteria that there are criteria that are like scored criteria. They add up to 100%. In addition to that, uh, there are what we're calling prioritization criteria. Uh, simply to kind of help uh, maybe bring some context to ultimately the uh, studies that come forward to you with a recommendation uh, from the external review panel uh, that reviews applications that we receive as part of this program. Hopefully all the information that you need uh, to have this discussion is in your packet. Happy to answer questions. Uh, the uh, memo includes a recommended motion from staff. Comments or questions for Mr. Calvert? Motion being put forward would be to move to approve the FY1819 Station Area Master Plan Urban Center Eligibility and Evaluation Criteria. Do we have such a motion? So moved. With that second. Motion, and we have a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> On to the next item. Mr. Rieger. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, I'm gonna talk tonight for a few minutes about FAST Act uh, required performance targets, really exciting stuff. Um, these are targets that are required by uh, the FAST Act, the Federal Surface Transportation uh, Legislation. One thing I wanna make clear in starting out is that you're going to hear in a few minutes from Brad Calvert again about MetroVision Performance Measure Report. While these topics are related, these are very distinct things. What we're going to talk about right now is sort of federal requirements that are very sort of short term, uh, very prescribed in terms of what we have to measure, even how we measure it, even the data source on some of them that we need to use. Um, again, very short term, very prescribed, whereas what Brad is going to talk about in a few minutes on MetroVision is more our sort of Dr. Cog um, initiated uh, longer range uh, performance measure reporting. So definitely overlap in the content area, but I do want to make clear these are two different things. Okay, so uh, for those who have been uh, on the board for a while, you will know that um, this is uh, one in a series of conversations we've been having over about the past year or so as these requirements have come out, uh, sort of rolling set of requirements of a series of uh, performance targets that we need to adopt. Um, the good news is we've already done some of them. So just about a year ago, actually in January of this year, we adopted safety targets uh, for 2018. We're actually gonna be coming back to you in a couple months because that's one of those that we need to do annually. So we'll be coming back to you for 2019 safety targets. And then a few months ago, uh, working with CDOT actually to um, adopt a joint targets on a couple measures related to what's known as peak hour excessive delay um, and non-single occupant travel. So those have been done. So 
So the ones you see here are the ones that are in your packet tonight and in the resolution, and there's a table, uh, both in your packet and the resolution with sort of the numerical values, uh, the targets that we're asking you to adopt. Uh, we're going to go through this at the very highest level, and I'm not going to read these to you individually. Uh, what I'd simply say is that uh, the remaining targets that we're required to adopt really deal with two things. One is infrastructure condition, and the other one is system performance. Many of the targets that we're going to uh, talk about in the next couple slides um, apply to what's known as the National Highway System. And we just wanted to kind of show you a map of what the National Highway System, or NHS, looks like. Um, particularly when you hear sort of that word national, you tend to think of like US highways and interstates. Those are indeed part of the NHS, but as you can see on the map, it also includes many arterials. Um, I think even some collectors that you wouldn't necessarily think of uh, would be on the system, but it's really the major roadways um, in our metro area. So we wanted to at least show you visually what that looks like. So I'm going to turn this now over to um, William Johnson, who is CDOT's uh, Performance and Asset Management Branch Manager. I hope I got that right. Um, bottom line, as we go through this, really the message I want to deliver is that um, the motion that we're going to ask you for in adopting the resolution is to support um, the targets that CDOT has already set. We've worked together with CDOT. Uh, we have confidence in what they're doing. We want to support kind of what they're doing. We don't think it's necessary to adopt separate, separate targets in these for the Dr. Cog region, but we did want you to hear from CDOT about the work that they did to set these targets. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, members of the board, thanks for having me tonight. I hope everybody can hear me OK. Thanks. I do want to establish some context here. So I'm going to go back to that and say, what does this mean for Dr. Cog? Is This is a federal requirement. And as we establish these targets, when we look at the interstate or the national highway system, we look at things in terms of lane miles when it comes to pavement. And for pavement, what that means within the Dr. Cog boundary, we're not just talking about local roads. We're talking about the interstate and the NHS within the Dr. Cog boundary. Roughly 1,000 lane miles of interstate, 3,800 lane miles of NHS. Now, when we started down this road roughly three years ago, Dr. Cog staff have been working with us hand in hand to understand what the requirement was, look at the data, to get to a point when we finally had the federal rules, May 2017, we, we had a good understanding of what was required by both CDOT and Dr. Cog. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank Jacob, Steve Cook, and also Beth DeLibo in assisting us on this endeavor. They got us to where we're at right now in terms of Dr. Cog recommending to support the state targets that CDOT established. Our targets were established April this year by resolution of our Transportation Commission. Now through these slides, I'm going to give you some quick background information. Please feel free to stop me, ask me questions if I'm not getting into enough detail for you. And um, I don't want to picture a horror story about the data. But one overarching theme that you'll find here is, again, we knew what the final rules were in May 2017. Not a lot of time for us to figure out the data. This isn't just a Colorado story. This is a national story. Many other states also did not have time to get a good record of data in order to establish trends in order to model, in order to really feel confident about the targets that they established. However, to mitigate those risks, what CDOT did, working with our leadership as well as our commission, is we used the data to the maximum extent possible that we had. And we took a very conservative approach towards target setting. Generally, what that means is for our targets, we weren't shooting for the moon because we didn't exactly know what state we're in right now. Given one year of data, with known data flaws, things that we'll be working on over the next year, here is what our commission agreed to do. So as we go through this, you'll, you'll see, um, for us, the, the fair condition that's not really a required target. It's sort of a, um, a, a side effect. We established good. We established poor targets for both pavement and bridge. 
one you're looking at here is for bridge. With this one, in terms of the poor target, there is a national <laughs> minimum of no more than 10% poor structures. I'm not going to say that we're smashing that target, but what our line was, was we just rounded up down in some cases what condition we thought we were going to get. CDOT has a number of programs that go into affecting bridge condition. For us, the major program there is the Bridge Enterprise Program, which takes care of poor bridges. For good condition, we have a separate program, which is our Bridge Preservation Program that assures we're going to achieve targets in that area. For us, even though you're seeing a, a downward there for a good target, we're trying to beat the forecast. Our forecast actually shows us being worst. Any questions? Moving forward, here you have pavement. Pavement again, we establish good and poor targets. We do it separately for interstates versus non-interstate national highway systems. The overarching theme here, again, is we establish very conservative targets. For interstates, we're doing pretty good when it comes to poor interstates. However, just like bridge, we forecast declining condition. And our goal is to beat the target. Level of travel time reliability. We establish this for interstate and non-interstate NHS. There's a separate measure for truck travel time reliability. Please do not confuse these as being congestion measures. They are very much reliability metrics. Difference being is if you're measuring congestion, you're usually looking at it as a ratio of what's my peak period time versus my free flow travel time. What this is measuring is based on a pretty broad peak period. How slow are we going overall? And it's very comparative to your travel time variability within those peak periods. So things like uh, non-recurring incidents, crashes, heavily affect variability. And when you have an area that has frequent non-recurring congestion events, you actually have more reliability versus an area if you have one event, you get huge variations and get less reliability within that. For this, we used a data that was provided by FHWA. It's called the National Performance Measures Research Database. It is a subscription tool and it's not going to say it was a push of a button, but it was pretty close to pushing a button. Now, for us, this is one where, again, you can't view it as a congestion metric, even though I think everybody has a good understanding in the Denver area, as well as statewide, congestion is on the increase. What we're looking at is reliability here. And so we, we think overall we'll either be able to to maintain that course or get just a little bit better in terms of travel time reliability. Here is where we continue with our system reliability metrics. Um, these are the, the on-road mobile emissions metrics. For these, they're only applicable to areas that receive the congestion mitigation and air quality funding. Now this one, it's going to be a little confusing. So general approach here is you see 2020 target, 2022 target. Often get asked, why is that going up? What this is is a calculation based on the projects that are funded with CMAQ. The idea here is that we want to trend upwards. That means that we're funding the projects with CMAQ dollars that get us a good benefit reduction. Does anybody need me to explain that a different way? It is not an air quality metric for a region, just projects that 
had a benefit reduction in these particulates. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, so is it, would it be appropriate to label it on-road mobile emission reductions? Yes. Um, Thank you. It, it would be, but that's not how FHWA taught it. Um, so before I go on, uh, I think Jacob had mentioned that you have already adopted some of the performance metrics like the uh, peak hourly excessive delay as well as the um, non-SOV, which are nonetheless confusing. Uh, but I'll, I'll conclude this here and I'll, I'll hand it back over to Jacob if there's any other questions Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, last slide just to kind of talk about next steps. Um, big point here is that um, CDOT is required to set on many of these two-year and four-year targets. We, as Dr. Cog is the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, are generally required to set four-year targets, but we will have an opportunity to work with CDOT. And let me back up and say two-year and four-year, talking about 2020 and 2022 uh, target timeframes. We will have the opportunity to work with CDOT um, in two years to kind of reassess based on you know, where we're at at that time, um, continued improvement in the data, additional analysis, some of the things that William talked about, and we'll have that chance to kind of reassess um, and potentially I think we can change the four-year targets at that time if we see yeah, a need to. And, um, apologies for not mentioning that before. Uh, for us, again, our, our performance period is a four-year evaluation period that However, there is a mid-year evaluation in 2020, at which time the state may adjust targets um, according to the new data set. Uh, I want to say that right now we have every indication that we will be revisiting the targets that we have established. And when we do that, Dr. Cog will, of course, as well as the other MPOs, uh, will be a, a huge stakeholder in that. And if we do make a change, their clock starts ticking to make so I think I'll conclude just by saying, you know, you probably have the question, what does this all mean? How are we using this? Again, it's a federal requirement. The point here from the federal perspective is that we have a data-driven uh, transportation planning process. And I just want to say that, you know, we've already been doing this at Dr. Cog. You all in your communities, you know, use, use data and make data-driven decisions already as well. Um, and we've been doing, you know, forms of this for years and years. But these particular ones, um, as I've said, are prescribed by the feds, the things we have to measure, how we measure them. Uh, they will show up both in our long-range transportation plan, our MetroVision regional transportation plan, as well as uh, linkages to the transportation improvement program. So in other words, the plans that we're making, the projects that we're funding, how do they get us towards achieving these targets in the short term? So with that, um, we have a motion in the, uh, in the agenda memo asking you to uh, approve a resolution that adopt uh, the targets that we've gone through tonight and be happy to answer any questions. This is an update to the packet. It did say in there the RTC would take action. They did take action yesterday because the packet was already out before the meeting. The RTC did approve the uh, recommendation to come forward to the board. Are there any comments or questions on anything you've heard from our two presenters? Ms. Shaw? Thank you. If you can go back a couple of slides with the VOCs and particulates. So I just don't fully understand this slide. I'm not sure exactly. <coughs> It looks like our targets are to reduce these things. Um, and then in two more years, to increase them significantly. And I don't understand. So William tried, so let me try. And uh, okay. see, this is, this is absolutely a confusing one. A lot of this is confusing, frankly, and I do want to acknowledge that. This one, unlike the others, first of all, as William said, this is projects-based. Some of the other ones we're talking about are kind of regional or there's a single thing. This one is totally dependent on the projects in the federal database that tracks projects that are funded with CMAQ dollars. So this is literally kind of driven by projects, first of all. Secondly, this one is a mission reduction benefit. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. We want to increase the benefit, the emission reduction benefits that we're getting. 
And that's why you're seeing the trend in the numbers of actually going up. Going up, bottom line, is a good thing because it's additional reduction benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah let, let, me, let me talk about that downward trend. Okay. So when it... Hang on, guys. Yeah, Mr. sorry. Yeah. When Deborah, I know your, oh, your hand's go going really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the easiest way to think of it is if you take that first one, VOCs, this is kilograms, um, the current condition is 101. In the two-year target, you want to you want to go decrease that 101 by 86. So you're only in the whatever that math is 20. No. Is that what you're saying? Um, no. If I let, let me try to re-explain this. Don't worry. This is the one that holds up everything. Um, so. And the rack's not even involved. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be brief, but again, stop me if I'm not getting into enough detail. We calculate what the target is going to be based upon a five-year history of our CMAC public database. Within that CMAC public database, the information in there is based on projects that have a calculated reduction benefit. So every project that gets funded with CMAC dollars, they calculate what the benefit will be within these mobile emission metrics. And then they add that up and report it into this database. Now, when we look at that five-year history, it's all over the place. It's not consistent. Not only that, we look at the tools made available to calculate what the reduction benefit will be all over the place inconsistent and don't cover all the things that we fund with CMAC dollars. Over this next year, uh, Tim Kirby has been uh, with uh, DTD, CDOT, has been leading a team in identifying more consistent tools, better tools to calculate that what, what that reduction benefit will be. So as we approach this, the current condition, that was the data that was in there. We reported that. However, looking back and trying to figure out what that target is going to be, we couldn't average things out. There were a lot of blanks. So we said, you know what? Conservative approach. What was the lowest number that was in that five-year database? That's the number that we're going to put in there for the 2020 period. But we, knowing that we're going to refine the tools, refine the process to make it more consistent, we think in 2022 we'll get a little bit higher in the benefit reduction. What that means is we're going to be able to pick and quantify that reduction benefit on better projects. But uh, apologies for not getting that correct the first two times. Smith, did you have another comment? Okay. Other questions or comments? As it was proposed by the staff, the motion would read to adopt a resolution for the proposed targets for infrastructure condition, system performance, and air quality as part of the performance-based planning requirements of the fixed, Fixing America Surface Transportation, also known as the FAST Act. Do I have a motion? Thank you, sir. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those uh, in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Mr. Cottrell, I think you're back up again. Folks, this one I think you're going to be wanting to particularly hear what's going on with your TIP process. OK, I'm up here once again um, for the 20 to 23 TIP cycle. So just a, approximately four weeks ago, the regional call for projects closed. And we received 20 projects totaling $109.3 million. Uh, that is contained within the attachment that you have. Um, this. Uh, so what, uh, what has staff been up to since then? Well, um, Last week, Dr. Cog's staff finished up scoring the projects and turned that information over to the TIP project review panel. Um, they have met a couple times. Their second meeting was actually earlier today. Um, and they have reviewed these scores. And they have started to shrink that list into what we're calling the tier one list. And that's approximately 
um, of the target funding, which is $32.5 million. So right now, they've whittled that down to a list of approximately 70 to $75 million. Um, they also today um, chose projects in which they would like to hear presentations from project sponsors. Uh, those presentations will be given to the panel one week from today, um, next Wednesday the 24th at 2.30. Um, board members are certainly welcome as anyone, anyone from the public. Um, I will now certainly work with Connie to get notification out to you in case you would like to attend. Um, after the, the, uh, the presentations on October 24th, so next week, um, the panel will reconvene to uh, make a recommendation on what suite of projects will be contained within that $32.5 million target. Um, then that will happen in early November after the elections take place. Uh, in hopes that they can come to some kind of recommendation that will be brought forth to our committees and also this board, um, either in the November or December time frame. Um, and so once that actually takes place, we can begin the sub-regional call for projects, which will happen early next year. So that's a quick summary of kind of where we're at with the, with the call for projects. Uh, any questions or comments that you have? Make sure that if you get a call to come in and talk to the board, you don't blow that off. That's a, a one-time invitation. All right, thanks, Mr. Cottrell. Mr. Calvert, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ms. Dolsman. Thank you. So, Todd, I have a, a couple questions for you. Can you tell us what projects are in that Tier 1 section of projects? And um, if a project gets called in for a presentation, does that mean it's in a different echelon, or there are just questions about those projects? No. So the ones that were are being asked to make a presentation to the panel, um, that does not mean that projects that are being asked or are not are being considered. It, they just requested additional information. That's all the panel members had, had, had asked. Um, in terms of which projects are no longer in that list to be considered, as actually there's only four of them um, from the deliberations that took place. And now I'm trying to remember because I did not write them down. <laughs> I'd rather you not tell than make a mistake. I can. Might be best to come back at a later time and provide that information to you. I mean, yeah. we'll be sending an email out, and that will contain that information, Todd. I assume. Yes. Other questions or comments? This is just a presentation, Mr. Dyack. With this being a new process, I'm kind of curious as to how, how the climate was, how the interaction was. I mean, I think the goal was more collaboration, um, you know, that there was some trepidation about this new process, at least early on, or down the road. Can you kind of report back as to what your observations are as to what the interactions were in the climate and the collaboration? So you're, you're talking about the panel, correct? Correct. Okay. Would you like me to explain more right now or come back at a later time with once they've made a recommendation. Uh, I mean, just, just high level, your observations. Certainly. Did, did they work well together? Was, uh, it, was it collegial? I'm yes. Just... I, I believe everyone was sort of putting on their regional hat. Um, certainly put their local hat on when necessary if questions were asked about specific questions. Um, so the staff did provide the panel with the list of scores. Uh, and they did talk about other ways to look and sort of start to look on ranking the projects other than the score that was provided. Um, it should be noted that the score that we provided um, was between a one and a three. So three representing high, one representing low. And the spread was somewhere between, say, one and a half to two and a half. So there wasn't much variation between. Um, one thing that the panel really did go into was looking at whether this was a true construction project. So at the end of the four years, there would be something on the ground built. Um, they also looked at whether this was a study or whether it was some combination of uh, preliminary engineering. So it didn't quite get to the construction, but it did do something to advance towards construction. Um, so the, the, uh, the panel kind of split that into three different piles and kind of looked at it in terms of what's more manageable to look at like projects. So that's kind of where the deliberations went today. Questions? Uh, Thank you. Mr. Calvert, I think I have you up again.
Thank you for Todd for having three items tonight, so I don't feel bad about about only two. Uh, Doug just reminded me and told me that I did something I didn't know. Uh, there is a revised version of both the memo and the presentation at your place. So look for a memo that has a few little red lines on on the front end. If you're if you're trying to follow this electronically, the main agenda packet does not include the revised information, but the calendar event associated with the board meeting actually has the same electronic copy uh, that's in front of you. So thank you, Connie, for doing that. I had no idea that that was happening. Very 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 smart of her, of course. Um, See, good news, uh, I think this is a lot easier uh, to sort of track than the last performance measure report that you just got. Uh, <laughs> these are regional long-term, uh, not required by the feds. Uh, the bad news is if you don't like them, we did, we did them to ourselves. This is us as you as board members holding uh, yourselves in the region accountable. So maybe that's, that's some good news, uh, bad news. Um, you, I will mention that I am not going to hit every single performance measure. Um, these are all part of the MetroVision plan that the board adopted back in January of last year. Uh, you adopted 16 performance measures at that time. The packet includes op all observations for all 16. Um, it's probably not worth our time to go through 16 performance measures. I'm going to hit four just in some ways to help you interpret uh, what's in front of you. If you see something that you want to know more about, we can always come back, whether it's this uh, meeting um, or a work session or, or whatever, uh, to talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, and I will just mention that all this will ultimately end up um, on the Dr. Cog website uh, as well. Uh, so I always like to use this when we're talking about MetroVision related items. So um, as the board was thinking through the MetroVision plan, you were doing two things that were very difficult at the same time. Big picture, grand aspirational, what do we want to be as, as a region in the year 2040? But let's do that within a structured way, right? So that we can, we can align our regional aspirational vision with our overall strategic planning models and organization, right? So that took a lot of time and effort. Um, that plan process includes the highest level strategic altitude uh, within the performance, uh, within the planning model. Um, such as overarching themes and outcomes, all the way down to the lowest altitude of strategic initiatives. Uh, tonight, we are going to talk about uh, performance measures and targets. Uh, I will just mention, uh, I did give a, uh, an overview of initiatives back in, back in February. Uh, that is also something that, is, that, the, that the board talks about at your annual workshop. Uh, so we, we, we are hitting you several times uh, a year with, with this information. Um, so as I, as I noted, uh, the board spent a lot of time not only talking about what should those 16 performance measures be, um, what should the targets be, but you also spent a, time, a lot of time talking about well, what does it mean to us. Uh, and what you see on the slide are really kind of some, some excerpts uh, from the MetroVision plan that the board adopted. Uh, the idea behind uh, this performance uh, management system is to verify whether our shared actions are moving the region towards the desired outcomes that are laid out in the MetroVision plan. And importantly, um, they are not intended to judge the performance of individual jurisdictions or projects. This is really about collective impact. Is, are the, all the things that we're working on in the region advancing us to the shared outcomes that are associated uh, with the MetroVision plan? Couple of uh, very quick disclaimers. Do not anticipate any measure uh, and observation between, let's call it 2014 and 2040 is going to look like a straight line. There's any number of reasons why Year over year, you are going to see sort of choppy um, uh, results from, from observations. Also recognize that you're looking at, in general, three years of observations. You really can't draw firm conclusions with three years of observations for 25 years uh, worth of measurement. Uh, so it's really, and it's also hard to then sort of extrapolate those trend lines out. We've tried to kind of give you staff's gut reaction of where they fall uh, within ahead of schedule, behind schedule, just to kind of get the conversation going. I will also mention one that's not on the slide. Answering the why question is always going to be hard. We can speculate. We can talk about a few things. But the really universal why as to, as to why one measure is moving one direction or the other, there are so many factors in a region as complex as this that getting to all the whys is really never going to be something that, that we can do. Um, and I will also mention, uh, and it sort of came up in the, in the previous performance measure conversation as well, we are always looking to improve our data sets and our methodology for thinking about how we do performance uh, management. So that, that is just something that is part of this work. Uh, 
if there are um, improvements in data sets or improvements to the way that, that, that uh, measures or targets uh, can be measured, that actually requires a, a board action for us to have in the plan. So anything in that space you will always see before um, that's really something that becomes part of the performance uh, management plan. So again, this, this is the corrected uh, version, kind of just an overall um, uh, uh, cheat sheet uh, in terms of how uh, we're doing on all of the 16 performance measures. Basically, half and half, half uh, ahead of schedule or on track, um, half behind schedule, or uh, we use the term no determination, mostly because the term, the data's gotten a lot better and we really should have had a different baseline, it's too long to fit on a slide. Those two are really about data improvements, maybe more so than it being fuzzy as to whether we can make a judgment call one way or, other, or the other uh, in terms of whether we're ahead of schedule or behind. Uh, I, like I said, I'm going to mention just four measures, again, mostly to orient you to the, to the content of the material. We have plenty of time uh, going forward uh, as we continue this work to maybe talk uh, in more details. I do want to give you kind of an idea. Like I said, every single performance measure has a slide uh, in the presentation kind of after sort of that thank you slide. What you have in front of you, uh, you're going to see um, the baseline and every observation for each uh, measure. So that's kind of the, the left-hand side of the slide. There is kind of a uh, sort of diagonal uh, trend line that would be if you did draw a straight line between the baseline and uh, the aspirational target, what that would look like. And then those orange squares are the observations associated uh, with each year. Uh, so this is, I'll use this slide. So like I said, I've got four where I'll kind of I'll walk you through them. This is one that was corrected and I'll explain the, the error just in case the wonky folks are interested. We all love Excel at Dr. Cog, but it is oftentimes really easy to make a simple mistake that sort of cascades throughout uh, what you're doing. Um, and so we had five measures that really kind of ran into the same issue. Um, and, and so in this case, this measure is a percentage of, the, of uh, uh, housing near high frequency or rapid transit. Um, you can see uh, the observations as well as uh, the 2040 target. So that's a year over year uh, series of observations where Units that are accessible to transit obviously change, as well as total unit count and the region changes. Uh, we ended up always linking back to 2014 for the total unit count in the region, right? And we caught it like three days ago uh, as we were sort of prepping for this. We're like, oh, oops. <laughs> and that's what happens when you have a limited, limited set of observations. It's really hard to just eyeball the data and know instantly that you got something wrong. And in most cases, the, 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 the um, impact was really minor, but we obviously did want to give you um, the correct um, information. But the good news is uh, that this is ahead of schedule. Um, as you can see, the baseline uh, for this was 14% uh, of housing units uh, met this uh, measure in terms of being located near high frequency uh, or high capacity transit with a target of 20%. You'll notice that pretty big jump uh, between 2015 and 2016. Despite my caveat that, that why can be difficult to explain, this one's actually a pretty easy one. Uh, that is simply the transit system expanding having more stations uh, and increasing kind of the catchment area. And as we talked about actually with the board during crafting measures, that's one way that this measure can move in the right direction is simply having more high capacity, and more high frequency transit. The other way is to obviously add uh, more housing units uh, near those, those locations. Uh, an example of, of a measure that's on track um, is regional population uh, weighted uh, density. You will notice in a couple of the slides, we actually went pretty far back. If it was really easy and clean and didn't bring any sort of methodological noise uh, to the measure, we went ahead and did that. So it was pretty easy for us to go back to 1980 uh, to show uh, population weighted density uh, in the Denver region uh, over the course of that, that time. As you can see from that sort of fake uh, trend line, uh, we're at the, the, the target the board set was actually more amb ambitious in terms of seeing an increase in density in, in developed places that maybe the region exper had experienced in the, in the 20 or 30 years uh, prior. What was really sort of interesting as we put this together is this is exactly what you heard from the state demographer at the board workshop if you were there in August. What she said is she keeps hearing the term, there's unprecedented growth happening in the Denver region. That's just not true raw numbers, we've had other periods of much more uh, expansive growth. What's happening is you're having a lot of growth in developed places, more intensely developed or more intense product, and it just feels like it's more uh, growth in terms of uh, population uh, or employment, but in reality, it's just sort of where that, that growth is happening. So, so by and large, on track uh, for this measure. 
Uh, one that obviously the board spends a lot of time uh, thinking about, uh, vehicle miles uh, traveled uh, per capita. Uh, as you can see, we are, we are calling this one behind uh, schedule. Uh, you, I think, next month are going to get uh, Dr. Cog's annual congestion report, which, which will spend a lot more time talking about this measure of congestion as well as, 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 well as some, some other items. But as you can see, we are behind um, based on these observations uh, for this measure. Uh, I hate to stand up here and suggest that I and feel like I'm suggesting correlation, but if you look at those uh, orange uh, squares, uh, it tracks really well. Uh, unemployment goes up, VMT goes uh, goes down, and as soon as you enter the recovery and unemployment uh, goes down, VMT goes up. Again, I'm not here to talk about causation correlation, but if you plot those two together, they would look pretty darn uh, similar. Uh, so that we did want to give you an example of, again, we call it no determination, but I don't really think that's the fairest uh, descriptor. Um, this is uh, the protected open space measure. Um, so uh, the board set a target of increasing the amount of protected open space um, in the region. Uh, when the board was discussing this measure and target, our uh, regional parks and open space data set had roughly 1,850 square miles of parks and open space that we characterized as protected. Lo and behold, we had some very um, good data conversations with the state land board, who has lots of property holdings, many of which they do not necessarily consider protected uh, as open space. So we've now made it, created a better uh, regional data set, which ultimately dropped, as you can see, every observation before what we thought the baseline was um, back in, in 2014. So this is an example of something that we will bring back to you to say, listen, frankly, we've got better data right now. We've had a, 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 an important partner reach out to us and make um, some improvements to our data set. So maybe this is something uh, the board should consider in terms of whether this measure still makes sense. And if so, um, should we establish a new baseline uh, and a new target? So a few high level observations, and I kind of alluded to this uh, previously. For some measures, uh, sort of our robust economic recovery is a tailwind. For other measures, it's a headwind. It, that's, just, that's just the reality. It's obviously helped with adding population and employment uh, in areas uh, well served by transit. It has not helped necessarily on the VMT per capita measure. Uh, a few um, ideas uh, related to uh, what's next. Obviously, this is not an action item. This is um, here uh, for your information. Every conversation that you have each and every month can help inform this work. It doesn't just have to be when we're here talking about the overall uh, performance management approach uh, to MetroVision. As I mentioned, when it comes to the actual measure itself and the target associated with it, that is a board action. So over time, if, if something comes up that you really want to address, that is, that is obviously something that was in, within your purview to change or, or to amend. You probably will see things um, like that from staff um, on a few of the measures, which I sort of have alluded to. Um, uh, we will be putting a lot of this information up on the metrovision.drcog.org website for uh, public consumption uh, as well. We, and I will also mention we're a little bit behind schedule and bringing this in front of you this year. Our expectation is this may be more of a quarter two uh, uh, information item that you see uh, in, in 2019. So this will not be the last time you see this and frankly probably in the next six to seven months you'll probably see uh, 2017 numbers uh, for these measures as well. I do just also want to mention, uh, you know, recognize that there is a lot of uh, activity happening in the region, but led by Dr. Cog, part of your uh, local community efforts that are all uh, helping us achieve those, those shared outcomes. These are just an example uh, of some of those initiatives. But as I mentioned in that very early slide, these measures are about collective impact. These are not necessarily individual uh, designed to ultimately evaluate or uh, weigh in on very specific uh, initiatives. Oftentimes, these initiatives have their own measures that are associated with uh, evaluating the performance of them as, as individual initiatives. But there is a lot going on that, again, hopefully move us towards those shared objectives and outcomes that are part of the adopted plan. That's it for what I plan to prepare. Um, I also have a phoner friend, uh, Andy Taylor, who leads our planning team and has really sort of uh, spearheaded all this measurement work across uh, teams and divisions here at Dr. Cog. So if you have a really hard question, there's a good chance it won't be me uh, that answers it, but happy to, to have questions from the group or discuss. Hey, comment or questions, Ms. Christman? Yeah, you have to use that funky thing. OK. Uh, when you go to traffic fatalities, um, 
and we're behind schedule, which I guess means more people are dying. But um, I think if I'm interpreting that correctly, you see more recently two very significant increases um, in traffic fatalities. Is that, I mean, I know you don't want to talk about causes, but is there a belief that that is an aberration and that it will start to go down, or are we seeing a trend upward? I'm willing for anyone else to take a crack at that that, that would like. Um, two observations, I don't, oh, look at Jacob right there. Thank you, sir. I turned that mic off, so make sure uh, that it's on. So I have two phone of friends. Thank you, Jacob Rieger. <laughs> Just as can he turn the mic on. <laughs> One that says mute, hold it down till it's green. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. There we go. All right. So um, it is hard to kind of talk about this one. It's not as hard as CMAC, so let's give this a shot. Um, if you look at the data going back 10, 20 years or so, um, there isn't the same kind of correlation that, say, Brad talked about regarding VMT and um, unemployment, for example. If you go back to, say, the early to mid-2000s, um, when, when the economy was still good before the recession, um, our rate of traffic fatalities, or even the number of traffic fatalities, was actually going down. Um, obviously, more recently, it's been going back up. I don't want to speculate as to why that is. You know, we, can, we can say it's the economy. Uh, we can say probably there's a correlation to, um, to VMT and to congestion. Um, we can talk about distracted driving and so many other things. Um, what I will say is on this one is that this clearly has the attention of us here at Dr. Cog, all of you in your communities, uh, CDOT, um, and our other partners. Um, Brad, if you could actually go back to your slide about some of the things, you know, what are we doing about this stuff? One of the things that we're doing, and we're actually about to kick this off publicly, uh, we've kicked it off internally, is a regional Vision Zero plan. Uh, Denver has one, Boulder has one, uh, Brighton is about to start one, maybe a couple other communities. Uh, we're actually going to work with you all to do a regional Vision Zero plan. Uh, CDOT, RTD, and others are also you know, hyper-focus on safety as well. So we're all going to work together on this to try and bring those numbers down. And, and I, would just, I will add to that. So we had an, sort of an internal staff discussion about uh, the Vision Zero Action Plan, I don't know, earlier this week. And all of us reflected on how often we've heard that issue from this body. Like, we understand that it is something that is very important uh, to this board. And so that, that is something that is very much influencing how we ap approach that work. Other comments or questions from anyone? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to committee reports. Ms. Jones, do you have the stack? Um, yeah, the September stack meeting was a little bit shorter than normal uh, because of the transportation summit, but the major focus of the meeting was to make recommendations to the Transportation Commission on the distribution of formula programs across the state. Uh, Ron Papstorf and Jacob Rieger were both on the subcommittee that helped develop recommendations, and the stack unanimously uh, passed the subcommittee's recommendations for funds for Metro Planning, STP Metro, the Transportation Alternatives Program, and CMAC. And at the next meeting, then we'll finish up uh, by reviewing the recommendations for faster, safer money and the Regional Priority Program. I imagine the latter will be a little more controversial because the subcommittee couldn't reach resolution on that. And the other thing I'd mentioned from the meeting is um, CDOT is planning to establish a, a subcommittee to help advise them on how to distribu distribute the Senate Bill 1 multimodal funding. From Metro Mayors, we had an introduction of a young lady by the name of Alice Jackson. Alice Jackson is now the president and CEO of Excel Energy Colorado. See, she just took that position of uh, having recently transferred up here from Amarillo. And David Eves, the former president, has now moved up another level. He is a regional president of uh, Excel Energy, covering multiple states other than just Colorado. So it was a chance to uh, meet her. Uh, I will tell you that she is attempting through the business groups that uh, she supervises within Excel Energy to reach out to all elected bodies uh, that they serve and hopefully have an opportunity to sit down and meet with each of you and introduce herself. So uh, expect the business development folks and the uh, political groups that are within Excel Energy to start reaching out to you. Uh, several of those meetings are already being set up with the uh, county commissioners, mayors, 
uh, around. So please uh, introduce yourselves when you have the opportunities. Seems like a very nice young lady and very capable in the background she has in energy. Uh, Metro mayors also spent a lot of time talking about what we've done tonight, uh, transportation. But another one, that, a big issue that's continuing to loom that Metro mayors is trying to figure out how to bring into the realm is uh, water storage. This continues to be an issue in Colorado, the drought conditions we've seen, <coughs> and a lot of the water that falls in Colorado leaves Colorado without ever having an opportunity to be used. Uh, water storage continues to be an issue. Uh, we're continuing to look at that. Affordable housing has not gone away. Uh, Clint and a couple of the mayors, am I missing anything from the MAC caucus from the third? Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Partridge is not here. He asked me to report on that if I can. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I got you, Joan. I'll come right back. So I just had the MAC met in Arapahoe County to discuss uh, the opioid epidemic, and it was actually a really helpful um, presentation by Robert Baluck, um, who was on the governor's opioid task force. Uh, then the Arapahoe County Sheriff and Coroner spoke, and then also the Tri-County Health Director. And uh, so if anybody's struggling with that issue, I'm sure we all are in our communities, they had a lot of very uh, innovative ideas that they're piloting. And uh, follow up with me if you want any of the information they handed out. Ms. Peck, you had a comment you want to add? I did, thank you. Actually, I just would like you to repeat the name of the Excel president that... Um... Alice Jackson. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Warren is not with us tonight, so we'll skip the uh, agency. Uh, Mr. Rex on the rack, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, several administrative items at the last meeting. Um, one referring to, we had a briefing on the 2017 audit, which was very successful. Um, there was a briefing on the uh, proposed plan for their work program and budget process for the upcoming year. We did get a briefing on the uh, uh, proposed rulemaking on low e emission vehicle program. Um, employee classification policy, uh, the, the RAC's employee classification will now follow the state of Colorado system. They used to follow Dr. Cobbs, go figure. Um, and, it, and that extended back to the day when RAC used to be housed at, at Dr. Cog. I mean, that was way back in the day. Um, had a presentation on uh, the performance uh, effectiveness of the advertising and outreach program at, at the RAC and a briefing on the Modown uh, pollution. And they also have a new snazzy website. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but I'd, I'd recommend you get on there. I think it's pretty cool. They did a good job with it. Thank you, sir. I want to cover for Mr. Rakowski on the E-470 authority. Mr. Roth. Thank no, you. I'm, I'm not returning your call. What's that? I'm not returning your call. <laughs> I, I was just checking to see if you had your phone off. <laughs> and here it rang. <laughs> so E-470, there was a, a presentation of the budget for 2019, a uh, very detailed binder and uh, departmental presentation, and e 470 is in really good financial shape. Hey, Mr. Van Meter, RTD. Just one update from RTD. Um, most folks are probably aware that we are in litigation with Denver Transit Partners, the consortium that constructed and operates and maintains our Eagle P3 project. So since we're in litigation, I can't tell you much about that. Um, but there have been there has been a lot of interest and concern from various folks um, regarding the status of those of the individual projects in the Eagle project as a result of the litigation and RTD's um, um, notification to DTP that um, they are in default of con um, or in breach of contract. Um, or default, I can't recall the exact wording, don't quote me, I'm not a lawyer. Um, let me get to the points. Points are one, the formal notice is giving a notice of continuing concessionaire termination event under the concession agreement. RTD is exercising and preserving its rights under the concession agreement. So the action RTD took is just preserving its rights under the concession agreement. It will not affect progress on the G line, slow as it is. <clears throat> we are committed to working with DTP to finish the G line. This is solely a commercial dispute, and this will not impact service on the University of Colorado A line or B line. So this is a commercial um, contractual dispute 
between the parties. We can work well together on the projects and um, there's no concerns regarding um, continuation of service on the University of Colorado A line nor B line nor making progress towards opening the G line. Dayak, you had a comment? Uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, we actually did have two uh, E-470 board meetings since last one. Uh, Director Roth did the latest one. The last, uh, the, the one that I went to, uh, the hazmat uh, corridor was being discussed for E-470 and the, uh, uh, the E-470 expansion from Quincy to I-70. There was a contract for, uh, for the construction manager, general contractor. So that, that is getting geared up so they can expand from Quincy to I-70. So good things, again, like Ross said, continue to happen on E-470. Hey, just a quick reminder, check your calendars. November 28th is the next meeting. So if it's already on your calendar, it's the wrong day. <coughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I greatly appreciate the attendance and the turnout tonight. Uh, hopefully you will see this same turnout in the future. To those who are attending your first meeting, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will come back to visit us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. That's it. Already have it on the